A bandsaw is a very useful tool to have in your tool arsenal, especially if you plan on using it to resaw. Bandsaws range from big industrial models with power feeds, like the one that LMI uses, down to mid-size light duty machines, and even benchtop models. Unless you are doing some major resawing of lumber, then even the small benchtop models can be real time savers for luthiers. No matter what size or model bandsaw you have, it is important that it is set up properly. Let's visit the Red Rocks Community College shop as Rand Richards, head of the fine woodworking department, shows us how to set up and use a bandsaw. First thing is, you gotta make sure your blade's going the right way. A lot of people have talked about, oh wow, my blade was made wrong. So if you notice, if I put this in there, the teeth would be going the wrong way. It's just turned inside out. Uh, taking all of the guide pushes, the thrust bearing, and everything like that off of the saw or loosen them so they're not gonna affect the way I put the blade in. The blade I'm putting in is a Laguna Lee Saw King Blade. It's a carbide tip blade. So many people want to know what the best saw is for resawing. And it's more just getting the right blade for the right saw. This one's four teeth per inch. Uh, and, and that would be the maximum for resawing. I want a little bit of turf. I want to be able to pull the sawdust out of that cut. You know, if I don't have much of a turf, I don't have much way to get the sawdust out. If I start building sawdust up into that turf, my blade will start to twist as I go in there. As soon as my blade starts to twist or slow down or bind in there, that's when I get those bad cuts. Uh, blade position is really important. I put my blades in the middle of the wheel. And that way they're, they're tracking evenly. They, they don't want to twist or bend due to the wheel profile. I've got the teeth hanging off off of this, just a freckle. And I might, as I do the adjustment, just bring them off just a little bit more than that. I've just got a little bit of tension. I'm just going to make a couple turns. As I make those couple turns, I'm watching the distance from the blade to the wheel to make sure that's consistent. As I turn the wheel, or the knob this way, uh -huh. I'll notice my blades start to track back towards the back of the wheel. If I turn it the other way, I can start pulling that blade out. And now I'm just moving it in and out just a little bit to get it to the point where it's stable, where it's not moving in and out this way anymore. And now I'll finish tensioning up the wheel. That's enough for me right now. Now I'm gonna go down to the bottom and I'm gonna adjust the side gates. Whether they were um, Carter bearings or Laguna's ceramic bearings, I'm gonna put it right up against the blade and, and I'm gonna put just a little bit of tension on it and then I'll back it off just a freckle. The old timers used to say the poor woodworker would use a dollar bill, the wealthy to do woodworker would use a hundred. So do the same thing here. I'm gonna bring it in and, and, and I'm gonna let it touch the blade and then I'll back it off just to scotch. And I'm gonna check to make sure it's moving nicely. Those are not actual bearings, what, what is that? These are ceramic guides. So it rides along the ceramics. Um, the thing I'm fiddling with now is a thrust bearing. This is the thrust bearing. It's gonna come up behind the blade and its purpose in life is to keep the blade from being pushed back. It might seem fairly trivial, but as I push the blade back, as the blade moves back, it twists. The, the less amount of that twist that I get in there, the better my cuts are. I'm gonna take the thrust bearing, I'm gonna push the blade so that as I move the thrust bearing, I can see that blade moving. And I'll put a little bit of tension on it, and then I'll take my blade and just push it back a little bit. So now I know I have a little bit of clearance, there's a little space between my blade and that thrust bearing, but really not much. So I just finger tightened it. I got clearance there. My bearings aren't making my blade move. But now, if you see all the room I've got between where my ceramic bearing is and the front of that blade, I want to move that whole bearing guide system forward. Because I want as much of these bearings to be on that blade. Again, we're trying to minimize that. I'm going to set it so the ceramic guides don't hit the metal on the teeth. And in this case, I'm going to set it to clear the gullets. Again, that's to make sure that sawdust isn't being built up. 
And now I'm gonna set the guide bushings. Again, they're just loose right now. They're not moving my blade anywhere. I'll put it right up against the blade. And I do the top a little different than I do the bottom. I put the one on the left as close to the blade as I can without deflecting the blade. So it's just, it's just kissing it. Then I'm gonna take my one on the right and, and I'll do that same thing. If I left them like that, I'm creating too much heat in there. I'm creating too much friction. So now I can back off that one on the right. Now I've got to do the same thing back here on the one on the left. Again, that dollar bill distance. So that's going to come up. And again, I'm, I can feel it, how it's pushing the blade. It's making the blade go forward. I'm going to put a little bit of tension on that thrust bearing and then physically push the blade back a little bit. And that gave me that clearance that I want. Um, blade tension. Right now we're around 20 pounds per square inch. And, and my blade doesn't sound too bad, but I want it to ring a little higher than that. I it's a D. <laughs> I'd have to ask one of the luthiers. <laughs> See, hear the difference? That's about right. A lot of people wonder about these pins and they're like, oh, you know, that's not important. They think it's just to keep the blade so it doesn't fall out again. If you leave that blade, that, that little pin out for any length of time, this side of your table and that side of your table won't stay the same. And that's really important. After setting up the bandsaw, you need to check for blade drift. Basically, this means can you push the piece of wood straight into the blade and cut a straight line? Or do you need to push it in at a slight angle in order to cut a straight line? Your feed rate, blade size and tension, motor size, as well as how sharp the blade is can all affect blade drift. So we've taken now our fence and we've adjusted it to be parallel with, yeah, pretty close, to be parallel with that edge so that as I bring my fence up now to my board and I put a little bit of pressure on it, my fence now is parallel with the board set at the drift that we wanted it at. I've had to change it. I've got adjustments under here that I can move it back and forth this way. As you can see, there's a lot of work to set up your saw and make sure it's working properly. For maximum yield resawing though, it is imperative that setup be done first. So, let's do some resawing. All right, so we have a piece of koa here that's um, been in the United States for less than three years. I, if I were to start on it and start resawing it, it, as soon as I started resawing it, as soon as I make my first cut into here, I'm gonna have moisture in this wood. I'm gonna have compression wood and tension wood that's gonna cause this wood to react in a bad way. My goal is to get as many thin pieces of wood out of this as I can. So our strategy today is we're going to cut a slab of wood out that's about that big and our, our goal is making guitars so when we look at this size we're looking at a guitar side so we're going to cut that piece of wood out then we have a piece of wood about this big and you can see the red lines on it and there's our larger piece which is going to be half of the size of a guitar back so we're going to have this billet and this billet left over and again, if I started resawing them, if I started trying to make thin cuts with them, you know, to make a guitar side or a guitar back, I'd end up with just a curled mess of wood. Because as soon as I open this log up, it's gonna react, it's gonna do something. So what we're gonna start off with is we're gonna take this billet after we square it down and we're just gonna resaw it in half. And, and an interesting phenomenon is gonna happen when I resaw it in half. One half of that chunk of wood is gonna actually get flatter. Some of this uh, bow, some of this twist is gonna go away. The other half of that piece of wood is gonna get a lot worse. Same thing's gonna happen on this bigger chunk. I'm gonna take this bigger chunk of wood, I'm gonna split it down the middle as best I can because I, I don't have real good reference lines. I don't have a real flat surface. And if you took a fundamentals class or a beginning wood, woodworking class, the first thing they're gonna tell you is flatten it before you do anything else. Well. That works pretty good until you get to understand that wood is kind of fickle. So we're going to try to guess at that fickleness. So what we're thinking is as soon as I start my resong, as soon as I open it up, some of that bow and some of that twist is going to get better and some of it is going to get worse. If I wasn't thinking ahead, if I wasn't seeing the whole picture, and I started off by flattening this big old board and then doing my resaw, I would lose a lot of wood. I would lose a lot of wood just because I thought it was better to flatten it. 
It's always a catch-22. You always have to guess. And, and we might even change our mind. We might get to the point where we make our cuts here and we make our cuts here. And this piece of wood is so twisted that I can't handle it on the boat. So I have to take some of it off. I don't think that's going to be the case. So we're doing this instead of just a straight line because there's a little bit of bow in this color. And so rather than trying to cut a really straight line, we're gonna follow that bow. And, and the theory being, and what I'm guessing, is this piece of wood that's curved this way is actually gonna flatten out when I cut it. This piece of wood that's curved this way is actually gonna bow a little bit. Since this coal was not flat, it was decided that to get maximum yield, we needed to follow the bow or curve as the cut was made. For woods with less pressure or tension in them, you can usually just set your fence to get the correct thickness you need and then make the cut. Most folks watching this video are not going to have access to the nice industrial saw we are using here. So let's use a saw that most woodworkers typically would be using to resaw you would still need to set up the saw like we've already shown. A saw setup, I could certainly go through and make a point fence and, or a fence. I'd have to find the drift again, but, but normally you, you can do resaws by following a line and, and you can do a better resaw by following a line. A point fence is a fence that's a certain distance away from the blade to this point. And that helps you, but, but it's not necessary. And we're gonna go after kind of a thickness similar to a guitar. And, and for anyone you know, listening to this or paying any attention, I wouldn't grab my 300 piece of rosewood the first time I ever did this. I, I, would, I would experiment with a piece of maple, a piece of oak, um, something relatively hard. I mean, if you grab a piece of poplar and you can resaw great with poplar, and then you go and you try with your rosewood and you're like, wow, what happened? You know, well, that's why it's a lot harder piece of wood. Maple or oak would cost you a lot less money to screw up on than, than your piece of rosewood. So I've got it positioned over here. Uh, I like to have between a half an inch and an inch of clearance. It, it helps me guide my saw, but we're going to lower it just a little bit just from a safety point of view. Stick. Okay. As soon as I stopped and restarted yeah. my cut, I've changed everything. Yeah. The key to any kind of good cut with a bandsaw is that consistent rate of speed. As soon as I stopped, I messed it up. I mean, I really should have had a push stick there waiting for me. Not what that $250 blade is going to get you, but it's a pretty good cut. And, and, and you'll get, you get better the more you do it. So don't do it the first time with your piece of rosewood. Um, one of the common mistakes that people make with the smaller bandsaws is they try to put a really wide blade in there. Like, you can put a three-quarter inch wide blade in this jet, but the little motor and the amount of tension that this frame will hold can't handle a three-quarter inch blade. I get better results with the quarter inch to the three-eighths inch blades than I do with the wider blades on a resaw. I've got a little bit of bow in this piece. You know, it's the same thing kind of looking at um, when we did that piece of koa. As soon as I resaw this and cut this, this side over here is going to flatten out a little bit more. This side is going to bow a little bit more. If I flattened it out completely right now, I'd be losing a lot of wood. So, whether you are cutting bracewood or high dollar exotic hardwood, with the information provided in this video, 
you now know how to set up your saw and use it properly to get maximum yield while resawing.